good afternoon everybody pleasure to be here so okay to keep everything in, everybody interested a quiz to start can anybody un identify the chart this is reasonably famous jackie it's, uh, it's the timeline of the march to russia yes right this is this is napoleon's uh, russian campaign uh, so okay so this tells a vivid story so let me and it's it's pretty puzzling. So imagine uh, army of 700,000 men, uh, the largest army assembled ever up to that point, uh, commanded by the Napoleon, who many considered the best general ever lived. They march into Russia lost, sorry, won every battle. However, came back, only 40,000 came back, about 1 20th of the army that went in. What happened? Right? So, this is very interesting. And uh, of course, the Leo Tolstoy wrote a complete 1,200 page book to tell what happens. Right, so, so, and if you look at the chart, oops, uh, okay, sorry, okay. This chart tells the story. The width of the, uh, width shows the size of the army. The first battle is at that corner, right? But you see it's going down. So what's going on is the landscape and the climate, right? And you see that the, the Napoleon came to midpoint, he put the army to guard his baggage line. You see that stopped. You see when he is coming back, it comes join and the line grows a little bit. Right? So this, this, this also considered one of the best visualizations. Right? One of the very famous and best visualization. And you see the, the temperature line drawn below. Okay? So, so actually, if anybody invaded Russia, historically, the strategy was very simple, right? You don't fight, you refuse to fight. You scratch the earth, you just keep running until winter comes, right? This is not the only time this happens. Sweden tried to attack, same thing happens. Napoleon tried, same thing happens. Again, another 100 years after, uh, German tried, exactly same thing, right? So, what you see is, in this situation, this, the landscape and the forces at play make a huge difference on the outcome, right? So, any competitive situation, understanding the landscape and the forces and basically understand the context, make a big difference on how, A, number one, how you plan, B, how you react when something unexpected happens. Right, so, so uh, in January this year, actually we started the CTO office, right? So of course, we are not trying to look at the war strategy, we are looking at uh, we are trying to understand the landscape of software, middleware, uh, what's, what's new technologies, what happens, etc. Right? So um, the, basically, we have two main tasks. One is the reference uh, architecture and reference methodology Asanka talked about, and we talk about that enough at the keynotes. The second part is uh, global technology outlook. Right? This is uh, effort to try to understand the middleware landscape and trying to understand how it changed, what are the new technologies, how to compare them, etc. Right? So the first version is not out. This is a little bit of early work, right? But uh, the some of the initial outputs coming in end of July, hopefully. So okay, let's get into detail. Okay, so the first step is we try to understand the middle landscape. Right? So we we basically um, look at what's out there, look at the analyst reports, etc. And we understood, we identified seven segments 
and, uh, and they have such subsegments as well. So this is, a, uh, this is a visualization of those findings, right? Uh, so the, the, uh, the gray color, or rather, uh, oops, the yellowish color is uh, small growth. The uh, green color is growth more than 20%, and the, uh, the orange, orangish color is about 10% growth. So it shows, it shows the size. Size means the in billions, the area correspond to the market size. The color shows the growth, and this icon on the side shows where the growth is accelerating versus deaccelerating. De and when it doesn't show anything, uh, most of the time we don't have enough data, right? Because to tell that, you need actually three data points to tell this, right? So you don't have that data every time. Okay, so, and so, so this is this is the this is the current state. So actually, to be fair, it is actually a little bit of a lag view because this does not include the uh, data like microservices or containers because the data is not available yet, right? So it's 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 about one year back view actually. So now now we have these seven segments, right? The first step is that they interact with each other, right? So this is. Uh, this sh trying to show it logically, right? You see the storage infrastructure, the apps and integration building on, and the observability analytics security on the side, right? And of course, there's IoT, right? So, so this is the this this what we have, right? Then this get interest. So, so unlike other landscapes, like if you take a landscape of a country, generally it doesn't move for a few thousand years, or actually I think million years, few million years, right? But the, not so in middle layer, right? So what happens is there are a lot of emerging technologies. Right? So there are a lot of emerging technologies. So they, they actually, so the, un, trying to understand landscape and trying to act on it is very much about trying to understand in the, these emerging technologies, right? So let's, let's try to dig in. So this, this shows some of the, this is a historical view of emerging technologies. I think on the keynote we talk about COBA, right? So if you haven't read, actually there's a very nice article called Rise and Fall of COBA, which take the COBA and talks as a pure technology level how, how powerful it was, but why it didn't work out, right? So, so you see that some technologies died, right? Some kind of hang around. Some actually were very successful. And they, although we don't talk about them, they are just everywhere, right? And fate of some technologies are not decided, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is not all emergent technologies are fads. There are some which are fads, but some are too early, right? And some actually are successful, right? If you look at, I think about one third were pretty successful. Right? So, so that, what that means is you can't just dismiss it. Right? So some works, some doesn't work. Of, of course, the catch is that you don't know which one. Right? So that's what we want to know. So to, to understand emerging technologies, let's look at the two models about emerging technologies. Now, very in, important thing about it is that this behavior we see it is not about the emergent technology, it's how we react to it. Because we can't help like, taking our hopes high and going crazy, right? So, so the first is a Gartner hype cycle. I'm sure most of you have heard about this. What this says is when a technology comes, we build hopes, right? So you, it goes through a hype, right? Very soon you promise to uh, solve the word peace and the word hunger and everything. And uh, of course then, you can't keep up to the expectations, goes down, right? And of course, then pendulum swings other way. Everybody is very negative, uh, basically is saying how stupid everybody were, and then you figure out some use cases, it, it basically come to the middle, uh, it works out. Now, okay, again, uh, there's a catch that it, that does, the, something is in delus, this illusion, 
stage does not mean it will be successful because some dies away. Right? It, these some, some just disappears at that point, but if you have real, something real in it, there's a chance that at that point it'll find out and come back. So there's another model. Uh, it's called Carta Paris Framework. This is, this is built to look at much larger technology cycles. Right, but the, it tells the same story. It tells that you start, you go crazy, right? And then basically the, there's no progress for some time and then you figure out and you try to go to the front. So, so what, this, what these frameworks tell us is that when we look at the emerging technology, we must look at without a little bit less emotion and a little bit more thinking, right? So it is not, it, it's, it doesn't help too much to be very eager or like on the party mode versus like completely pissed off saying this thing doesn't work, right? So basically you need to be in the middle. And you need to try to think, basically we need to try to see what is real, right? What actual problem it could solve, right? and what forces in play that might make it work versus might destroy it. Right? So coming to that, uh, so, uh, so one thing, this, this one part, one important part of uh, our findings is to, we try to identify some of the forces that affect technologies, right? Four of which are positive, Six of which are negative, right? So the f from the four, first one, obvious, if you can save money, it'll affect it, it'll propel it forward, right? Okay. The second is automation, right? So this is a theme that runs through history because we know that the first industrial revolution was that the people replaced manual power, manual work, they automated it. And we are hoping the second industrial revolution that comes with the AI would automate the decisions. Right? So that this is another theme, right? Because the, the, now the reason this happens is humans are expensive because that's the, you have to pay a lot of money. So it's, the reason it happens, I mean, in a way, everything, most of them goes back to cost savings, but I think it's useful to see that the automation has also as a one, uh, one theme runs through time. And the third one, um, the communication, integration, trust. So these, like for example, the technologies like, the, even the technologies like COBA, then the XML, web services, SOA, now even the blockchain. These technologies, what they try to do is, it let you build systems where each party assume less about the others. I mean, that is the common theme that goes through. Right, so if you could make that work, and it, that's, that's very, it's a close theme to the loose coupling. The loose coupling is you're looking from the more system point. The communication is how you connect multiple things, right? But the, again, so these, these are the four, four themes we see that runs through. Now, we, don't, we are reasonably, so we went through like a lot of scenarios, but there may be others, like if you have thoughts, et cetera, like through here, right, there may be others. So then if you look at the other side, the one of the limiting forces is lack of programmers or the skills. Right? I think this, this would be more and more true, like if you take, for example, big data and analytics and even AI, it is hitting this limit. Because, because the problem is that our education system was not built to create a lot of people has this stat and these skills, right? Now we need it, but it takes 15, 20 years to fix it, right? So, so I think this is this one of the forces that every technology that we look at, we have to uh, ask, would that affect? Because it would affect a lot of things. And obviously the privacy and security Right, because we all, we, I mean, we don't want to talk the, like that's enough. We all agree, right? Uh, and then uh, we all worry about monopolies, like when they lock in. Also, uh, as we see at the GDPR and PSD2, 
uh, the government and policy has a lot of power over what's going on, right? I mean, at least in my opinion, the, uh, so far the EU used the PSD2 and GDPR were at least looking at a better outcome long term. Let's hope that they'll continue to do that, right? But it's not a force that you could ignore, right? So, and finally, there is complexity, right? So this, this, and this, this one thing that bites us, because when we build these technologies, right? So this is a question that will continue to ask, because it's very hard to see what are the complexities we are creating for the future, right? We, I'll chat about that later a little bit. Like, for example, when we look at the blockchain, the, the promise is so huge that it scares me, because it's, it's almost impossible to see how would you pull off this much, right? And uh, so we then, I mean, there are a lot of things we, we might not know. So, okay, so, so this, there are 10 forces, right? So then let's, so this is basically trying to take the 10 forces, it, take the emerging technologies and existing segments. They are on the, Top, and you have the forces here, right? So if it is propelling, if it is positive, it's in greenish color. If it is limiting, uh, it is in the uh, orangish color. But you see there are things like, for example, there are some negative things that might affect positively because, because of the like security concerns, et cetera, blockchain get more um, interest, right? So there are some things that, although they are negative factors, actually they propel some technologies, right? Now I'm not going to talk through itself; it'll take uh, for age. But I'll make two quick observations. The first thing is that uh, cost saving is a key driver, right? I mean, there's nothing groundbreaking about that. I mean, we all know, right? Uh, then. Another interesting thing is that almost everything, except for very few, drives integration. Like, for example, if you, if you look at cost savings, if you look at automation, uh, or even the things like complexity, they, all those kind of look out for integration to solve their problems. Because it's about connecting, it's about making data accessible, it, uh, et cetera, right? So, so this is, I think, is a theme that we discuss a lot on keynotes, et cetera. You see that the integration kind of becoming driven by everything, which is a good news for us. OK. So then this is, so, OK, so basically building on this, this is a way to place and compare different technologies, different emerging technologies. So, so if you are a leader looking at these technologies, there are two questions that you want to answer for. First is the given a technology, what is its impact? Small, high, medium, right? Second is how likely it will work out, what are the timelines? Right? So if you know answers to this question regarding any technology, that give you enough knowledge to think, plan, and decide which one to go in, which one to go off, et cetera. So this, by putting on this chart, it try to answer those questions, right? So the stage of progress is not exactly the probability of success, because something that's in the third stage might be, might die, right? So there are some work to be done, and maybe we can improve it further, right? But so you would see that, uh, but we thought this is a very good way to look at everything holistically, to have a, uh, intelligent discussion about what's going on. Right, so, okay, so then, now so far we talk about how you look at these technologies holistically, right? Holistically, what are the forces, so what is out there, what are the forces, um, and how do you compare? How do you, how you have an intelligent apple-to-apple -apple conversation comparing them? So the, my last part, the second part, talks about how, can, how could you analyze individual ones. Basically, 
the, okay, what we were trying to go do on global technical technology outlook is first to look at ma many technologies holistically. Basically, write down what we believe about that. Right? So the, one way, one way it will communicate to the others what we think. Right? Also, it'll, it's potentially open a dialogue. Like, for example, if a customer sees it very differently, that's a chance to have the dialogue. And maybe we'll change our minds, right? Given more facts, we will change our minds. But that would, A, is that way to get, for us to get to feedback. Also, it will help us in planning, et cetera. Right? So then, now, from when we look at multiple technologies, we'll select few right, that, are, that we think are relevant. For those, we want to do more detailed uh, analysis, right? So for that, we had created something called uh, technology canvas, technology analysis canvas. So this is actually uh, inspired by there's something called business model canvas. So let me, let me go there and uh, try to explain. So what this does is, it's a template. It's a set of corrections. But there's a story behind the questions, right? So this is the story, right? So if we imagine technology to work out, we think there are a few things are needed. So there has to be a trigger. There has to be some significant trigger that starts this, right? And there has to be positive impact. All said and done, it has to make a difference. Then what it promised has to be possible. Okay, so this, this basically we are trying to put it together into a reasonable story, right? And of course, then then to make the final decision, you have to look at the future risk, etc. So what we had done is basically taken that that story and broke it to more details, so that you could answer each of these in more detail. So I'll switch to next slide. I'll explain this using serverless as an example, right? So if you, if you go to serverless, right? So the serverless was triggered by uh, the Amazon Lambda and other uh, function as a service offerings, right? So basically, this was pretty cheap. They become available, right? So that's how it starts, right? So you, we, see, we saw that many players come in, in including IBM, et cetera. Now, if you look at the feasibility, yes, it is possible, right? Technology is there, it works. And uh, there are like pretty strong one that's in green because it give you uh, HA, give you scalability right away. There's nothing to do, right? Which very nice. There are technology challenges like the call starts, tail latencies, et cetera. So I'm not going to go on through everything, but I'm trying to uh, like just give examples, right? So now if you, look, if you try to look at the tooling, et cetera, the way you have to program in serverless is a little different from what you would program in other models. So most likely you would need more new IDs, et cetera, to smoothen it, right? And uh, there are some friction, obviously, right? Because the serverless is very opinionated. Because the, if you go to a certain platform, you have to believe their story. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You can't change it, right? So, so the, these are friction, right? So, so, so but, from feasible side of view, it is possible. And in our, I mean, you have our conclusion, there are challenges, but they are not deal breakers in the way we saw it. Now, if you come here, if you look at the impact, right, the macro and micro means, macro means across, across the industry. Micro means looking at one organization point of view, right? So if you look from one organization point of view, the it's there's basically the you save money, there's reduction of cost and the agility. You could do things faster, and the like big advantage of uh, the macro is that the what people call functional decomposition. Paul talked about that in his talk, etc. Basically, the ability to uh, build a system, bring in parts from many different things. This, I mean, the one part of this called API economy. Not, I mean, there are other things, et cetera, right? So then if you look at the risk, et cetera, the vendor lock-in and lack of standard is uh, clearly a concern, right? So, uh, and, um, so in, 
in summary, what we felt was that the serverless, uh, to get to next level, most probably need an IDE, but it is, technology is feasible, right? So there's a, um, uh, there's a reasonable chance it can make a dent. Okay, so, so that's, that's how we put it together. Right, so, so our expectation is that for few selected set of uh, technologies, like about five technologies, we haven't finalized the list. We would uh, release this canvas analysis with the white paper, okay? So that basically to sh trying to share how we look, at, how we see it. Again, to communicate how we think, also to start a dialogue for whoever is interested so that we can dig into it further. Right, so uh, I'll, I'll just say two, a couple of words on two technologies. Uh, the, for, for blockchain and for AI, the canvas is on the way, it's half-baked, that's why I'm only giving the high-level one. Right, so if you look at blockchain, uh, blockchain promised to build decentralized system, decentralize everything, right? Uh, so the technology is still early. It can't do what it's promising in current state. It has to notch up a one level, which basically means, and there are hard problems, not simple. So it's at least like 10 years away, most probably, right? Uh, so also, but the, the vision is almost too big. Like, okay, so to, just to give one one challenge is that you can't undo anything, right? So the right now, if, some, if somebody steals money, you caught him, you, get, you generally, unless he like dig up and put the money somewhere and you can't find it, you can get it back. But not in the world of blockchain. You can't get it back, it's gone, right? So like, so one famous question asked was that, if you do the DNS, I mean, you could do DNS with blockchain. Now, if the CNN.com is hacked, what do you do? It's gone. No such thing, right? So, so there are challenges, right? So we'll, we, we don't know, like, so, so but we are, we are looking that at in detail. Uh, then looking at AI, uh, there are a lot of pretty significant wins. Right, it could potentially create the next industrial revolution, right? Replacing decisions, right? Automating everything. Uh, but obviously, it is hitting the limit on basically humans are the bottleneck. And basically, to trickle it down from Google level to the other organization level and down, uh, you need a lot of skill, and that skill is not there. And when you don't have the skill, like basically sometimes you can create disasters. Uh, so, so basically I'll, so that, that, that's the mainly what I want to talk about. So this is the timeline. So basically we plan to release the serverless canvas and the white paper on the overall methodology by end of July, right? So in about two weeks, right? So then the plan is that we will, like every two months, we'll do a series, a can, different canvas white papers on each few technologies, and uh, like once a year, we would summarize putting it together. And uh, we plan to continue to do that yearly. Uh, so mainly to, one thing is to share how we think, other is to start that dialogue, right? To get your feedback, what you think. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Uh, I can't take any questions. There are t-shirts. Re rewards for anybody who has uh, <laughs> good questions. I'm sorry, enticements. Oh, it'll be on our site. Yeah, on the, it'll be on the uh, our site basically. We haven't finalized the link, but uh, it'll be, yeah. yeah. I'll keep going, tell me when. This time. Okay. Let me give you, let me give you a microphone, hold on. Okay. Uh, this one. Okay, yeah. The WSO2 
currently in this diagram? Where are you? Sorry? Is... WSO2 as a company, where are you now on this diagram? <laughs> uh, so at least I'm expert at technologies, not in companies. I'm, I'm going to dodge that. <laughs> Quick. Uh, So th this is a Gartner diagram, I believe. Yeah. Um, so it, they, the way to answer it is it, they do this product by product, technology by technology, not company by company. So for example, they would, they would say ESBs are, are probably you know, on the plateau of productivity, but super early stuff like serverless might still be kind of a, a high in the hype cycle. But you have to do this by product or by technology, not by company. Yeah. Just, just uh, go, this is going back to yesterday where they were showing the disaggregation and it was this ramping up of, you know, we're going to the cellular level, we'll go to the atomic level, I yes. guess, at some point. How do you know that we're not on the upswing of a bell curve, it's going to drop back down again? I mean, that's, that, that's my biggest question is, is that every time there's a hype, right, there's, you see this cycle. Yes. And I'm like, okay, so are we going to come to our senses on microservices and say, man, why are we doing it the hard way when we can come back and maybe aggregate things more logically? Yes. So, so, so the way I would answer is that I think the, as a concept, I think, I think if you look through the history, we see that we go to a smaller, smaller, and smaller, and smaller unit, right? I think as an idea, microservices, et cetera, that you should try to create this independent unit is very powerful. Now, the, but the granularity of unit, I don't think we know for sure, right? Because it's, right now, I, th I think, I think Asanka was asked the same question, but Asanka said those that we don't know right now, actually, right granularity. So we, we I think basically, we would have to figure it out. It'll also change by domain and use cases, et cetera. Right? So, so yeah, I think we, we would go a little lower, a little back and figure out the right thing. Right? I, I think the most important thing is that knowing that, that you can't know the answer for sure, so that you uh, keep open and see, when you see the friction, you have to come back, et cetera. 